Thank you. Well, as you continue through this wonderful season of Easter, I trust that the church will be encouraged and challenged about what it all means. It was my privilege this morning to preach in a church of Scotland in Salkots, and it was actually a word that's much overused, exciting, but it really did feel exciting to be able to speak about the words of Jesus that first Sunday evening when he said to his disciples, I'm sure it wasn't in a relaxed fashion. There'd be a fire in his eyes, a passion in his voice, as the Father sent me, I'm now sending you. What a privilege, what an amazing thing that ordinary people like fishermen, tax collectors were called to take forward the work of God begun in Jesus Christ, the gospel. Now, we're taking a break from that, and this evening, as you continue in this interesting series on Teach Us to Pray from the Lord's Prayer. And uh, tonight, we're going to be looking at one verse, well, actually three, so you may find it in your Bibles. I don't have, I don't know if you have a few Bibles in this church, but I'm sure you have your own Bibles, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. And uh, this is contained in what we call the Sermon on the Mount, the distillation of all the teaching of Jesus on what it means to be His followers, His disciples. And you've been reading these words from verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And now our verse for this evening, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And then next week, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then Jesus possibly paused and then added these words that are so important for us. For you see, if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Wow. Amen. May God help me to explain these words in a helpful fashion. The subject I was given, the simple title was our debts. Oh, that will not change up. That's fine. That's okay. I don't need to panic. <laughs> our debts. Now, in homiletics class, that's the art of preaching in college, they said, if it's possible, it's sometimes useful to begin a sermon with humor, wit, a joke, a funny story. And I thought, debts. Well, that's not a funny subject just now, is it? So, the kind of best I can do is something like this. It said those who are surrounded by many debts but still press on in business are worthy of a lot of credit. Well, it's there somewhere. <laughs> You're allowed to laugh. But of course, the debts we're thinking about this evening are not financial debts. It may involve that, but this is something in our relationship with God. So, let's again look at these words so that we get them clearly. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then those words repeated again. If you forgive others when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father in heaven will not, not forgive your sins. What does this mean? Well, to try and help us answer, I've got three, as I often do, words. We're going to ask the question, what? what? What is this about? What does this mean? We're going to ask who, to whom does this apply? That may seem logical, but maybe not so when we unpack it. And then how? How does this work? Well, there's the first one, what? Well, let's be clear on what the verse is not speaking about. It's not speaking about salvation. Now, salvation's a biblical word. You can't read any of the New Testament letters without discovering it in some, some shape or form. What does it mean, salvation? Well, basically, it means being put right with God. In a crude sense, it means getting to heaven. And it's commonly held that, well, if I'm kind, 
God will be kind to me. And so, if I forgive people when they wrong me, surely God is going to forgive me. Well, whatever people may believe, this verse is certainly not about that. It's not about being saved. Let's take a quick look on familiar territory, I well imagine, for a church like this. What is salvation? What does the Bible say about this interesting word? Well, John chapter 3, verse 17, the fourth gospel says, God didn't send His Son into the world to condemn it, but to save the world through Him. Well, there it is, to save the world. Save from what? What does that mean? Well, says Paul, writing 50 or so, or less than that actually later, he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, we do all sin, but does that matter? And in our modern world with political correctness and so many things against speaking fully and clearly the Word of God, does it matter? Can we not eliminate this unfortunate, unhelpful word sin from our vocabulary? Well, says Paul, the fact is that because of our sin, our disobedience, our breaking of God's law in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions, and we've all done it, the fact is, he's writing to a church in Ephesus now who have received this message of being saved. He says, we were by nature before we received this message and responded to it, we were objects of or deserving of God's wrath. That's not a popular message, and yet it's the Bible's truth. And as I look out in a world today where in third world countries and in the West, messages like this are being clearly but lovingly proclaimed, the church is growing. People are responding. The truth actually matters. We were objects of wrath, deserving of God's wrath, but back to John chapter 3 and verse 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, should not be cast out of God's presence ultimately, but have instead the gift of eternal life. That's what this is all about. I, I, I think it was beautifully put in a recent clip from a tape by Alistair Begg. Many of you, I'm sure, listen to Alistair Begg's preaching. Scott, born here and has been for 40 years the pastor of a church in America with a, a real gift of communicating God's truth simply. And someone sent me a lovely clip the other day, and it would be wrong for me to try to ape what Alistair said. You can find it if you Google these words, the man on the central cross said I could come. You'll find it, and it's worth looking at. Alistair describes how explaining the purpose of Jesus' death and the fact that there's nothing we could ever do to get to heaven. He thinks about the, the thief on the cross. You remember the story of the man who was cursing Jesus one minute, and then maybe it dawns on him who this man really is, or he has some awareness. And he turns to him and he says, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And in Alistair's little story, he says, here's the guy, he arrives at heaven's gates, and the angels look at him. Who is he? Excuse me, sir, why are you here? I, I, I don't know. Well, could you explain? What do you know about the doctrine of justification by faith? Well, never heard of it. What do you know about Bible truth and accuracy? Don't know what you're talking about. Surely you must know something about grace. No, I don't. We'd be get a senior angel to ask you more questions. Why are you here? And the man's response is simply this. The man on the cross next to mine, the central cross, said, I could come. And Alistair does it brilliantly. And it's so simple and yet so central and truthful. That's why any one of us will get to heaven. So this important verse, as we're going to see this evening, has something to tell us but it's nothing about that. And if I go to the last little verse in this excursus, Paul puts it so concisely. He says, listen, it is by grace 
that you have been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, not by me being nice, not by me being kind, not by being me forgiving, but by trusting in what Jesus did. The man on the central cross says, I can come. And we need to cling to that so no one can boast. So, what? It's not about salvation, this verse. But let me add, it's not about justification. Now, I don't want to make age divides here, but it may be that older people will resonate with what I now say. You see, when I was, I think I was 21 when the Lord got hold of my life, and I knew God was calling me to be a preacher. And before preparing to go to Bible college, I thought I'd better begin to study the Bible. And then I got flu. I remember lying in bed there in Largs, and my father came home from business in Glasgow, and he looked at me in bed. He said, what are you reading? I said, I'm reading a commentary on Matthew. Where are you reading? And I was reading these verses. Oh, son, he said, that's not for us. Oh, no, what's that for, Father? Oh, that's for the future millennium. That's for a different time. Why is that? Well, the answer is because we have been justified by faith. We don't need to confess our sins. Wow. And I wish I'd been able to say to my father then as I could now, sorry, Dad, wrong, wrong, wrong. Do you know, as I look back, and I appreciate so much that I learned in Brisbane Evangelical Church Largs, I don't think I ever heard a prayer of confession in the diet of worship. And I believe it came from this misunderstanding that was shared by many evangelical churches in those days. The fact we are put right with God, we don't need to confess. Well, we confess when we came to faith, I'm a sinner. Lord Jesus, receive me. Remember me. Bring me into your kingdom. I want to be saved. I want to be part of God's family. But no confession of sin. Now, I'm not saying that the elders and the members of Brisbane Hall, as it then was, ever confess sin. But I look back, and I think with disappointment and possibly even shame, I see it as a missing dimension. And as the Lord has taken us through so many different situations, we were just discussing it in the car coming over, the privilege we've had in being involved in so many different churches, how much I've learned from my Anglican friends who begin every Sunday with this act of confession at the beginning of the service. As I say in the Church of Scotland this morning, part of the diet that was given to me that there should be at some point a confession. Now, we could argue as to the, the merit of a general confession, but the point is to acknowledge the need as we're going to see. But this is not about justification by faith. This verse is not about me being brought into God's family. But then in other sections of the church, well, there's the verse that my father quoted. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into His grace in which we now stand. Absolutely right. So, the guilt of our sins dealt with fully by the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary. So, we stand in Him, as Paul puts it, justified by faith. So, why then did Jesus say, as your prayers, my disciples? This is not for some future dimension, some future dispensation, some thousand years, if such will exist. The Bible is true, but how we interpret what uh, Ro, a revelation is saying, and what Paul is saying in Romans, it is a question of great debate. All I know is that Jesus is coming back, and He will reign, and there will be peace, and I will be with Him. These are the great truths that we cling to. So, why did He say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors when we are justified by faith? But let me come quickly to another thing that it isn't. It's not about sanctification. Now, I haven't met churches, but Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones in his great exposition on this explains that there have been churches within the evangelical framework in the West who have said, no, no, this is not for us. We don't need to confess our sins. Why? 
because we have been sanctified. And one of the verses quoted is this one. For by one sacrifice on the cross, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14, our Lord has made perfect forever those who are sanctified. So what's this about? Well, let me come to it now. It's about a relationship. It's about relationship. This prayer that Jesus taught, this pattern of prayer to His disciples began with our Father. It's about a relationship. To just move to a side for a moment, back to John's gospel. On the night, Monday, Thursday, we now call it, that Jesus initiated what we call the communion, the night that He gathered His disciples around the table and explained to them what would happen, He took a towel and washed their feet. You remember the story. And Peter, indignant as he often was, said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And when the Lord explained that, well, it was important that that should happen, he said, well, in that case, wash every bit of me. Typical overemphasis. And Jesus said, no, Peter, you haven't got it. The fact is, when you've had a bath, all you need is your feet washed. And in that culture, it would be obvious the penny would drop instantly. What he was saying in theological terms was, when we are washed clean in the blood of Christ, a phrase that seems offensive in today's world, but is quite biblical, when we have been justified by faith so that we stand righteous before God, when we have been given the status of sanctified, made perfect, incredible in Jesus, the fact is that's the bath. We've had it. We had it when we were converted, when we came to faith. It was confirmed in baptism. But the fact is that day by day, our feet get dirty. Day by day, just like the disciples, dust gets with our toes. And that's what this verse is about. Now, forgive me if you say, well, you've taken 10 minutes to explain that, but I think it's important because these foundational things can so often get changed. And it was the lack of them in the 50s and in the 60s that actually did, and I hope, take me to task, some of you older folks, if you don't agree, affected many evangelical churches. And that's why I ask this question, how often in our worship do we confess? How often is that part of our diet of worship? And that leads to my second question, how often does that come in our private prayers? Well, that takes us to the second thing. But before we look at it, you made a call when I was here a few weeks ago. It was a pleasure to speak about this Aramaic phrase, Abba, Daddy, Father. And I explained that while it is commonly used in preaching and in theological thinking, only three times does it appear in the New Testament. And all in the context of a challenge to obedience. Supremely, our Lord Himself, when in the Garden of Gethsemane, facing the awfulness of the pain and the cross, He says, Father, if it is possible, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, I'm close to You. I'm willing to do Your will. If it's possible, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not mine, but Your will be done. And in the two other references in the epistles of Paul, it appears where there is a challenge to their growing faith. And the point is this, that there are two sides to being able to say, isn't it wonderful? God is my, my daddy, my father. I'm so close to him. We can really only say it with integrity when we are acting in obedience. And all that leads me to say there is absolutely no doubt that this verse and the verses that follow in 14 and 15 apply to us to born again boys and girls, men and women, adults, teenagers. This is about the family. And the challenge is this. Is this part of my daily worship? Is it part of my church's diet that we confess our sins, that we acknowledge where we fail? Well, if you don't agree, what are you going to do with these verses? For if you forgive men their sins, your Father will forgive you. But if you don't, He will not forgive you. That leads me to the third thing. 
How does this actually work? It's interesting, there are at least four Greek words for sin in the New Testament. And the words that Jesus uses here are actually most interesting. The first one, debts, has the concept of pain caused, hurt given, offense communicated. So, he says, forgive us our debts, where in our selfishness, when in our sinfulness, we cause hurt to others. And if we cause hurt to others, and even ourselves, we cause hurt to God. Forgive us our debts, where we forgive our debtors. But this idea of hurt is so important, and it's a missed concept in so much of our evangelicalism. We're saved. It was a pitfall in the early church to the extent that a thing grew called antinomianism. I'm saved. I can do what I like. No law. I don't need to worry. I'm going to heaven. Doesn't matter. Justified by faith. Praise God. Hallelujah. And antinomianism became a scourge in the church. And I think there are forms of that in evangelical circles, not exclusively, but certainly. And we do not remember that God is hurt by the way we live. That's why Paul to the church in Ephesus, listen, don't grieve the Spirit of God. How do I grieve the Spirit of God? By my sin. When He prompts, I ignore. When He moves, I resist in my thoughts, in my words, in my actions. And this preacher is very guilty of that. And I need to confess it, my hurt to the Holy Spirit. And the second word, when it says in verse 14, if you forgive men their sins, the Greek word means slips, falls, not necessarily intentional. There's another Greek word that does identify things that are quite calculated and deliberate. Judas didn't just slip. He calculatedly went to betray Jesus. And we can calculatingly betray the Lord Jesus. We can deny Him. But sometimes we do it unconsciously. And the Lord's point is that this is who we are. That's why Paul so helpfully in Romans says, you know, I'm a wretched man. And I still have some commentaries where the the, the commentators will say, of course, he was referring to when he became a, before he became a Christian. And I've got to say, nonsense. He's referring to his Christian experience. That's who we are. That's why we need constantly to be confessing our sins. That's how we need constantly to be saying, Lord, put me back in right relation, my right relationship with you. And so, how does it work? Well, first of all, here's a staggering thing. This business of confessing my sins and therefore forgiving others, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, this is natural. Natural? Well, I should have added the word spiritually natural. It ain't natural in itself. So, I have to forgive others because God has forgiven me. I I think a brilliant example of that was an experience Margaret and I had some years ago. We had the privilege of having use of a person's, a couple's apartment on the Canary Islands. And every year, sometimes they would actually pay the flight so that we could go and enjoy the sunshine for a fortnight. And visiting a church, just sitting in the pew one Sunday morning, I was aware that there was a very smartly dressed, tall, handsome fellow, and he gave, got up to give his testimony. What a testimony it was. It turned out that he had been a, a London gangster. He was the head of a kind of British mafia, protection racket in some of the Scilly Isles, or the Canary Islands, I should say. He'd been the head of a, a consortium selling food under false pretenses, under false names. 
a real lad, but he had come to faith through one of London's best-known churches. His life was wonderfully transformed. He was now a respectable businessman, and there he was, coiffured hair, his Rolex watch, a gold medallion, crocodile shoes, a striking figure. But he gave a wonderful testimony to the glory of God, but it was shocking because he said this well-known church, the minister was so concerned about him that someone from the leadership was responsible for mentoring his spiritual growth. Now a respectable businessman, he was traveling internationally. And coming home on one occasion, his wife said, I, I have news, good or bad. Well, I'm pregnant, going to have a child. And then a moment of silence, but you're not the father. The man that church in the center of London sent to look after you has actually been looking after me. This man, in his testimony, and he was quite open about it, he said, I picked up my phone, and I phoned the lead minister in the big church, and I said, what am I going to do? And he said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I want to do. I want to raise some of my old friends, and he could be in concrete in the bottom of the Thames by sunrise tomorrow. No, said the minister, you're going to forgive him. And the man said, well, maybe in a thousand years. No, he said, you're going to forgive him right now. The situation with your wife, the birth of a child, that will take time. That needs to be dealt with, but you will forgive him now. Why? How did God forgive you? And it dawned on him. He forgave me instantly. He forgave me on confession of my sins. Said the minister, that's what you need to do. And that's why courageously he stood. And as we all sat there open-mouthed and listened to the testimony, he told us. At the end of the service, coffee was distributed. And he was a striking figure. And I don't know if people avoided him, but he seemed to be on his own. And as you know, my wife is shy, retiring and so she went up to him and said, is anyone asking you back for a cup of coffee or lunch? No. Well, he said, she said, we're in a little flat across. It's not ours. Do you want to come and have lunch? He said, I'd love to. And that afternoon, he shared with us the details of the story of a life that had been wonderfully transformed and suddenly shattered by this situation. I wouldn't go into details. It was private, but sufficient to say that he really did forgive that man, a Christian brother who abused the privilege of being part of his family. That's why in this word, there, there's, it's very simple in the, the, the Greek language, forgive our debts as we also have forgiven or and forgive our neighbors, our debtors. The Lord is saying, this is going to be the way it is. That's why Paul writes again to the Ephesian church and says, come on, you're God's children. Be like his children. Forgive one another as God has forgiven you. How has he forgiven me? Completely, unconditionally. Ah, but that takes me to the second word. Conditional, that I forgive others or don't. Verse 14 for if you forgive men their sins against sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. This is this relationship thing, not about salvation, not about justification, not about sanctification. These are great truths, but that's not what these verses are about. It's about our fellowship with God. But if you don't forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive you. Does that mean you're not going to heaven? No, of course not. But what it does mean is the clouds come in. I often jokingly, as I begin, I'm preaching in different churches, I say, I'm John Carrick from Larch, where the sun always shines. And of course, people smile because it's not a nice place when it doesn't. But it does. It's just that clouds come. It's just that rain lashes the shore, but the sun's still shining. But I'm not getting the benefit of it. Nor are you if you come on a bad day and all you can get is ice cream and nardinis. And you see, the Christian life can be like that. Isaiah said to the people of his day, you know what's happened? Your sins have come between you and your God. 
he is not answering. Friends, I want to finish tonight on a challenging note. And I say it, I hope, with appropriate humility because I am a great sinner in this area. Is it possible that some of your prayers are not being answered because an unforgiving spirit is hindering that blessing coming? Is it possible that you read the Bible at times and it seems you're getting nothing from it and you're surprised and disappointed when someone else says, you know, in my daily readings the other morning, I was so blessed, and you think, why am I not? Is it possible that you're harboring a spirit of unforgiveness? You see, that will affect so much of your relationship with God. It's on hold. It's on hold. Does that ring a bell? I don't know. I'm sure there's unity in this church, and I genuinely pray, we pray for this church. We pray that your unity and the blessing that God has given you through the coming of Bert to join the leadership team here will continue because Satan wants to divide you, tear you apart. Don't let it. But is there a spirit that could just break out? Don't like this. Don't want that. And there's a lack of forgiveness. And then you wonder why maybe there is not the blessing that you did have. Oh, I've seen that in my own ministry in the South, where as the lead elder, if you like, the pastor, the minister, the main preacher, I know God was calling me to do something else. And I said, no, no, no. And while in our church in Ringwood, we were seeing literally month by month people coming to faith, it stopped. And my relationship there was with God. God was calling me, but I wouldn't accept it. I wasn't forgiving in that sense. And sometimes it can be among people, but sometimes it can be a, a, a vertical thing. Sometimes it can be a horizontal thing. Other debts that need to be cleared tonight. Other things that need to be said. A letter written, a phone call made, a prayer offered. Then grant please God, that it will happen so that the benefit of this tiny little verse, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, will be real. John puts it so well. He says, listen, be clear on this. This answers all the questions. If we claim we are without sin, that's what my dear, dear father needed to see. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Wow. But if we confess our sins, who's we, us, Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ? He is faithful and just, he's absolutely fair and will forgive us our sins. And more than that, he'll purify us from all unrighteousness. And just to be clear, says John, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. And the truth is not in us. I want the truth to be in me. And I want the truth to guide me and direct me. God, help me to do it by forgiving when I am wronged, by forgiving when people say things that maybe are wrong. And Jesus said it would happen. In fact, he said, they will say all king kind of things falsely against you for my name's sake. What am I to do about those people out there who want to shut me up? I've concentrated mainly on the Christian family, on the Christian fellowship, but what about society? What are we to do about them? What did Jesus do as they drove nails into his hands? He says, Father, Father, forgive them. So these people then trying to influence Holyrood, trying to lobby Westminster, I've got to forgive them. I've got to pray for them. I want to discuss with them. I hope I'll do it with courtesy if the opportunity arises, but I've got to forgive them. They don't know what they do. They've been deceived by the enemy of our souls. And our failure to see that and to respond to that is actually a real failure in terms of these verses. God, give us hearts that are open and loving and generous in our forgiveness and keep us united and keep us moving forward with the message of the one who gave himself freely for us. Let's pray.
Father, your word is powerful, and I do trust I've been able to strike helpful notes for your people here tonight. Send us away not discouraged, but encouraged, and give us integrity and honesty so that we can say, Lord, I failed here, I failed there, and I confess it. And grant that as a result, we'll see the sun shine again. Answers to our prayers, your word riching our lives, your Holy Spirit directing and guiding us and using us so that the gospel may advance in these needy days. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.